Hey, Redcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to Mildly Nuclear, whose continued support makes it possible for me to keep making videos about the games I love to play. Thanks a lot, Nuke. That said, let's get started. February was a pretty big month for Phoenix Point. Between Julian Gollop's second AMA session, the briefing number three, and the new convention demo, we've had no shortage of things to talk about. I've actually collected almost 20 pages worth of notes and quotes over the past few weeks, so today I thought we'd take a look at some of the highlights of what we've learned. Now, before we get too far, I should touch on a couple of things. First, we've already talked about the briefing number three, so there's not much point in talking about it again. While the demo did confirm some of my theories and provide some extra context, I think I covered the latest batch of stories pretty thoroughly in my last video. Second, I'm just going to assume that you've already watched gameplay footage from the new pre-alpha demo. Unfortunately, I don't actually have the rights to any of the recorded footage, so I can't show it here. I'll include links to the relevant videos down in the comments section, so go check them out if you haven't already. It's fine. I can wait. Needless to say, the new convention demo has a lot more content and polish than the prototype demo from the original Fig campaign. It gives us our first good look at a lot of the new art and sound assets, as well as several of the game's core mechanics, though of course it's still a work in progress. As good as the demo looks, it's important to remember that everything is still under active development. I could spend all day talking about the demo, but for the sake of brevity, let's just focus on the highlights, starting with a mechanic that's most likely to confuse casual viewers. Let's spend a moment talking about Phoenix Point's simulated ballistic system. Under this system, ranged attacks essentially create a cone of fire originating from the attacker's weapon. Each individual bullet is tracked as it follows a randomized spread pattern along that cone of fire, until it either strikes an object or flies off the map entirely. This is actually very similar to the simulated ballistics used in titles like Jagged Alliance and the original XCOM trilogy. It goes hand in hand with the game's intended cover system, which is essentially what you see is what you get. Every object on the battlefield will have a hitbox that closely matches its shape and size. This means that any obstacle between the attacker and their target might end up physically blocking one or more of the bullets being fired. This is especially true when firing at a target that is standing adjacent to certain types of cover. When a unit is standing close enough to any specially marked cover object, such as barricades, walls, or crates, then they will automatically try to snap on to that object. This essentially means that the unit is trying to actively make use of that cover, reducing their profile and making it more likely that attacks will hit the intervening object. Of course, this also goes hand in hand with the game's destructible terrain system. Most objects in the game can be destroyed, so hiding behind cover isn't a guarantee of safety. A powerful enough projectile might end up cutting right through cover and striking the target behind it. In fact, if it's strong enough, it might even end up cutting right through the intended target and continuing on to strike something else. This means that the player will always need to keep things like potential collateral damage or friendly fire in mind. On a somewhat related note, the demo included part of the game's planned inventory system in the form of a quick slot wheel. This feature allows a character to quickly switch between certain items without the need to spend any additional action points. In the final version of the game, the player will also be able to spend action points to perform other special inventory actions, such as picking up or dropping items on the battlefield, equipping different items in their quick slots, or even using items directly from their inventory. While the finer details of the inventory system are still undecided, Julian Gollop has made it clear that trying to carry too many items in your inventory will end up negatively impacting a unit's mobility. It's interesting to note that the demo also included several other partially implemented features that will be included in the final game. For example, the battle map used in the demo scenario was partially built using the game's planned procedural generation system. In the final game, most maps will be randomly generated to increase replayability, with the notable exception being havens such as Fort Fryheit. These locations will follow their own special rules, being randomly generated but sporting features based on the facilities and units that are present at that particular haven. 
Haven battle maps will also remain persistent between visits, which is particularly important because Julian Gollop has repeatedly stated that the player will be able to actively raid or infiltrate enemy havens. We might even end up being able to conquer enemy havens, though Julian has stated that the development team is still discussing whether or not this would actually fit with the theme of the game. Similarly, the development team is currently debating the subject of voice acting in the final game. The demo notably included new sound assets, including a fully voiced introduction and epilogue. The developers even recorded combat barks for the soldiers, though they didn't end up having enough time to properly implement them. While it seems unlikely that Phoenix Point will have any extensive degree of voice work, Alan Stroud has mentioned that he would at least like to include short audio files as part of the game's overarching narrative. It's also worth mentioning that, in addition to the combat barks, significant content ended up being cut from the demo. For example, while the demo ended up featuring updated versions of the iconic Crab Men and the Crab Queen, at least two other enemies, including an updated version of the Larva, weren't finished in time for the convention. Likewise, the demo was originally intended to showcase all four of the character classes planned for the new Jericho faction. Unfortunately, the animations and abilities for the technician weren't finished in time for the convention. While the character model is still present in promotional art and as scenery on the battle map, the class itself was cut from the demo. Beyond that, the demo also included our first in-game look at the Armadillo, one of the first ground vehicles confirmed to be in the game. While the Armadillo was disabled for the purposes of the demo, the developers have stated that vehicle functionality has already been partially finished. In the final game, vehicles like the Armadillo will allow the player to rapidly move soldiers around the battlefield, possibly even driving through terrain and over enemy units. These vehicles will be available in multiple configurations. For example, the Armadillo will have options for at least three different equipment loadouts, including a version sporting a mounted machine gun and another dedicated towards transporting a larger number of troops. While there are currently no plans to make the convention demo available through other venues, the developers are planning to continue working on it behind the scenes. Snapshot Games will be showcasing the demo again at EGX Res in April, possibly updated with some of the content that didn't make it into the version we saw in February. Now, aside from what we learned from the demo, the developers have also been generous enough to share details about the development behind some of the game's other systems, perhaps most notably the systems related to the procedurally generated soldiers that the player will be recruiting in the main game. We've heard some of this before. For example, Julian Gollop recently reconfirmed the basic attributes that each of our soldiers will possess. Endurance will determine a soldier's overall health and hit points, mobility will determine a soldier's movement range and overall agility, and willpower will determine a soldier's morale and act as a resource to fuel special abilities in battle. There will also be attributes or skills which will determine how effectively a soldier can use certain weapons or pieces of equipment. We've also already heard a decent amount about the planned character class system. In early interviews, Julian Gollop mentioned that they were working on three basic classes and five specialized or elite classes. More recently, Julian has updated this to three basic classes and at least seven specialized soldier classes, with the possibility of additional elite classes being added in future DLC. The three basic classes are the Assault, the Heavy, and the Sniper. We've also heard at least a little bit about five of the specialized classes, including the Heavy Infantry, Infiltrator, Mutog Handler, Priest, and Technician. Recent comments from Julian appear to confirm that each of these specialized classes will be unique to one of the game's main factions, with Heavy Infantry and Technicians coming from New Jericho, Infiltrators coming from Sanedrion, and the Mutog Handlers and Priests coming from the Disciples of Anu. We also learned a few more basic details about some of these classes. Obviously, we got to see New Jericho's Heavy Infantry class in the new demo. This character class relies on the use of slow but durable power armor, which allows it to use particularly heavy weaponry such as the heavy machine gun and a shoulder-mounted missile launcher. While it is a very slow unit and its sheer weight prevents it from being able to climb ladders, the Heavy Infantry also comes with a jetpack to allow for sudden bursts of enhanced mobility. Julian also gave us some basic details about two of the other elite classes as well. 
New Jericho's technician class, for example, is described as being very versatile. This class can use mechanical arms and specialized tools to heal allies, repair vehicles, hack computers, place automated gun turrets, and even make powerful melee attacks. Julian also recently described the Mutog Handler, a class unique to the Disciples of Anu, which uses a telepathic mutation to control mutated dogs known as Mutogs. While it isn't confirmed, it seems likely that creatures like these Mutogs will function similarly to the drones used by other factions. It's also possible that we've already gotten a glimpse of what the Mutogs might look like, based on this early piece of concept art by Svetislav Petrov. A soldier's character class will determine many of their basic abilities, but character development will not be linear. Classes will each have a varied skill tree, with at least some randomized elements, and the game will also allow for some degree of multiclassing. Soldiers can also gain additional abilities or modifiers from elements of their randomized background, or through the things they experience while under the player's command. Alan Stroud recently spent some time discussing some of the systems that the developers are currently considering. The developers want to separate the idea of character development from military rank, with rank and overall ability levels being tracked as two distinctly separate things. Alan has also been working on a roster system that will allow for various randomized elements on newly generated soldiers, such as things like birth locations, secrets, and potential narrative events. His end goal is to make every soldier unique, with a short randomly generated background that will have at least some impact on how the soldier develops over time. Of course, the player will also have a good deal of control when it comes to customizing their soldiers. While the details haven't been finalized, both Alan and Julian have recently stressed the importance of customization, stating that the player will still be able to rename their soldiers and customize certain aspects of their physical appearances. Although the developers have stressed that their recent attention has been focused on the turn-based tactical layer of the game, they're still working on the global strategy layer. They recently shared some general details about their plans for the game's research and development system. Much like with character classes, each faction will have its own unique technology tree, and certain aspects of that technology tree will be randomized, giving the game a little more replayability. The player will be given several means of obtaining faction-specific technology, including through diplomacy, trade, espionage, or even violence. The player will also need to acquire specimens in the field to learn more about the threats posed by the Pandora virus. This will include not only researching aliens and their mutations, but also capturing and interrogating living mutants using a live capture system similar to the one featured in the original XCOM games. Julian Gollop has also stated that while many of the research projects in the game will have tangible benefits, there will also be optional research projects intended to simply provide additional information about the game's overarching narrative. This is somewhat mirrored in the events of The Briefing No. 3, which included several stories revolving around how New Jericho captures and interrogates infected individuals. Alan Stroud even went so far as to suggest that it might actually be dangerous to pursue certain types of research projects, especially ones that involve trying to contain or interact with captured targets. Speaking of Alan Stroud, he's also recently started sharing some new information about additional pieces of upcoming Phoenix Point fiction. The briefing number four, which is slated to come out sometime over the next month or so, will be heavily focused on the Disciples of Anu. It will also shed some more light on the mysterious Big Egg Incident of 2027, which marked the point where the general public first became aware of the Pandora virus. After that, the briefing number five will be focused on providing more details about Sanhedrion. Again, details are scarce, but Alan has mentioned the title of at least two stories that will be included in this collection, The Good Life and Imperfect Physiology. He's also mentioned that this collection will finally explain how Sinedrion deals with people who have been infected with the Pandora virus. Beyond that, Alan also appears to be working on at least two other stories focused on the new Jericho faction. One of these stories is called Iconoclast, which is set in the 2020s and describes how Tobias West first began laying the foundation for what would eventually become the new Jericho faction. The other as-of-yet untitled story will focus on Corporal Isaiah Thompson, who was featured in both The Briefing Number 3 as well as the recent convention demo. 
The latter story is particularly interesting because the developers have recently mentioned that at least some of the characters featured in the fiction will end up appearing in the final game. Alan Stroud has heavily implied that this may be the case with Thompson and his fellow soldiers. That pretty much gets us up to date with everything that we learned in February. Sadly, based on what we currently know, it sounds like March will be a somewhat slower month. The only event confirmed thus far will be Julian Gollop's third AMA session. That will be taking place on March 2nd at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, so be sure to visit the official Phoenix Point Facebook page for additional details. After that, it sounds like things might get a bit quiet until we get to April, which is when Snapshot Games will begin releasing the pre-alpha early access build to people who backed or pre-ordered the game at the luxury digital level or higher. It's also when Snapshot Games will presumably be showcasing their updated version of the convention demo at EGX Resd in London. But until we get some significant new information, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Phoenix Point, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the Facebook page, the YouTube page, the subreddit, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on FIG. Links are in the description.